Hey, it's me, that puzzle you're struggling to complete that's been living on your living room table for a couple of days. I know that I am hard and you've really hit a wall here trying to figure out what pieces to get, but I do think, and I don't have any evidence to prove this, but it can't hurt, right? If while you are doing the puzzle, you listen to an episode of this podcast. Before I continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, a reminder that this Thursday, July 30th, we will be doing a multitude digital live show. There's going to be a whole bunch of fun stuff going on. I'm doing a live meddling adults as well as a TED Talk about why Tony Hawk's Underground is the most important video game of the 21st century. I've put a lot of work into both. I'm very excited for both. If you want to get tickets, you can go to multitude.productions slash digital live. 25% of ticket sales are going to Black Lives Matter charities. And if you can't watch Thursday at 8 o'clock Eastern time, that is okay because a ticket will get you access to a video replay of the entire thing. So even if that's a weird time zone thing or you're not free that day, or if you're listening to this after July 30th, 2020, and you still want to see these awesome things, it'll never be too late. You can can always do this, head on over to multitude.production slash digital live to get your tickets now. And if you want more Potterless at live shows, well, guess what? You're in luck. I've got two more things coming up this weekend. On Friday, July 31st, I will be part of Scum and Villainy's live stream for Harry Potter's 40th birthday. I am doing a segment with Kim from Fanatical Fix. I am settling the debate of who's the better twin, Fred or George Weasley. I've used math. There is science involved. We come to an answer, and it's a very good time. And on Saturday, August 1st, I will be doing a Potterless live show as part of Harry Potter and the Sacred Texts summer camp. I will be doing that with Sequoia from Fanatical Fix, and it will be a random ranking and review of every great Ginny Weasley quote that has been said throughout the series. I guessed it on Harry Potter and the Secret Text and talked about Ginny the entire time, and I think that the only natural follow-up is to really go more in-depth into her most iconic moments and rate, rank, and review them with Sequoia. So if you want to learn about all of the things happening from the Multitude Show to the Scum and Villainy stream to the Harry Potter and the Secret Text summer camp, you can either follow me on social media, I'll post about it on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or you can go to multitude.productions slash live. And speaking of exciting things, something exciting that is happening is people keeping the show running, and I'm very excited to announce our newest members of the Patreon team. So shout out to Christina Hall, Catherine Conti, Anna Tullis, Alyssa Deerling, Lauren Rowell, Angelica Don't Say Pickles, and someone that made their name Malfoy, you little shit. And a huge shout out to our new producer level patrons, Ashley Somers and Grant Sohn. They join the ranks of Vicky, Aaron, Clown, Marchismo, Samantha, Juan, Rosemary, Maria, Romina, Audra, Eleanor, Nikita, Ali, Amelia, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Haley, Alex, John, Noel, Liz, Brandon, Claire, Rory, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Summer, Justin, Jacob, Maya, Mark, Polly, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addy, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Alicia, Kafir, Sarah, Marta, Eileen, Keegan, Mr. Folk, Maya, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Skyla, Adult, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Elizabeth, Michael, Kelly, Carrie, Connie, Jen, Nedry, Will, Samantha, Aurora, Marcos, Courtney, Marique, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, The Meadows Family, Jenny, McKenna, Heather, Brad, Thomas, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Chrissy, Yarl, Ashley, Peter, Sophie, Jen, and Callahan, Leah, Melissa, Bella, Melanie, Elizabeth, Britt, Becca, Rees, Adam, Joseph, Lily's mom, T. Ron, Money, Madison, Kyle, Tonks, G.K., Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, David, Matt, Okama, Hime, Yimki, Boney, Pony, Jacob, Kelsey, Taco, Blufish, Rike, Taylor, Rochelle, Megan, Alicia. Riley, Colleen, Laurel, Rossan, Erica, Miranda, Landon, Kendra, Natanya, Yogan, Darcy, Richard, Sandra, Craig, Andren, Kay, Steve, Lior, Angela, Julia, Demi, Kelsey, Michael, Danae, Michelle, Callista, Kringle, Lovekesh, Jennifer, Crystal, Henrika, Jeremy, Delkis, Katrina, Jerrica, Michelle, Casey, Megan, A Thousand Zot, Serenity, Jack, Sophia, Matthew, Dane, Rochelle, Kirsty, Robin, Chick, Mermaid, Aaron, Biatch, Ilaria, Liam, Lori, Gregory, Kristen, Nina, Ribbon, Kawkaw, Brittany, Ravenclaw, Gavin, Schulman, Atrix, it's definitely Ludo Bagman, Steamed Nuggets, and Cat I Potter, who never forget that they've clothes in the washer. They always remember to either put them in the dryer or line dry them and not just leave them in a wet mess inside the washer for hours on end. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus content such as bonus episodes, director's commentary, exclusive live streams, merchandise, and more, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 136 of Potterless, continuing our discussion of act one of A Very Potter Senior Year, guest starring Melissa Anelli. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man who didn't read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He eventually got around to it. Now he's watching the Harry Potter trilogy. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm the grown man, and I'm joined today by someone who has an intimate relationship with this particular production of a Harry Potter senior year. It's Melissa Anelli of LeakyCon, Mischief Management, and Roll 9 and 3 quarters. <laughs> Melissa Anelli, how's it going? Hello, it's going good. It's the coronavirus year 46. <laughs> you know? We're on the fifth decade of July. It's been 84 July. years. Um, I'm, I'm hiding out at my fiance's house in Massachusetts. Oh, yo, congratulations. I oh. never congratulated you on getting engaged. It's so fun. Thank you. It was our anniversary on June 4th, and so we 
got engaged to celebrate. Oh, he proposed good. with a shell. It was really sweet. That is awesome. I absolutely love that. That's adorable. Because, you know, it's a pandemic. There's no ring. Like, there's no, we can't do, like, the normal things. But it's really sweet. You can get a ring later. Oh, yeah. But. You need love now. That's exciting. I look forward to your your wedding in 2039 you know, when the world is normal again. At this point, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to like, listen, hey, I got this I got this uh, building we rented for Leakon. Let's just all wear dresses and that'll be fine. Ooh. ooh. I'll all wear dresses. <laughs> I guess wear a dress if you want. Sorry. I, I will. I will. You should. I <laughs> <laughs> just... You know. So we did not discuss a lot of a very Potter senior year, so I think <laughs> let's just go right into it this time. Let's do it. <laughs> So when we last left our heroes, they were flying in a magical car to go back to Hogwarts. They're singing a song about it. It's very fun. It's your standard we're going back to Hogwarts kind of thing. At first, I didn't think Darren was going to sing because he didn't really have any of the verses and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then he does sing towards the end. I didn't really know if... He was so unprepared that he didn't even sing in this one, but he does. Again, it's wild. I know he like had the material ahead of time, but how much time he could have spent learning it, I don't know. But the fact that he dropped, like airdropped into the space at 4 a.m. <laughs> that morning, and this I think it started at 1. Like This is like no, this is very little rehearsal. It was, the whole thing's wild. I feel like this production is prime for a documentary. Just all of the stories. If they haven't made a behind-the-scenes thing about it, I feel like this is absolutely ready to happen. So th they have their videographers doing the production, and we had our videographers just filming a whole bunch of stuff backstage. So I still have oh, all smart. that footage. So if they, st if they would like to do a documentary, I have footage that can help. They should do it. I will help. I will be Ken Burns of the... <laughs> A Amazing. very Potter documentary, and I will make it happen. <laughs> Amazing. There, sorted. <laughs> Boom. So they get to Hogwarts, but the car crashes into the herbology classroom, and then you have McGonagall enter, and I'm very happy that McGonagall is in the play. I was furious that McGonagall wasn't in the first two, but I'm not going to lie. I was disappointed that McGonagall was played by a dude. There is so much cross gender playing of roles in this musical. I haven't kind of clocked if it's like more men playing women or more women playing men, but there's just so much of it that I just sort of lost track. I guess so. Yeah, I guess that makes more sense. I think what made me feel bad about it is that it seems like there are more women that are just extra characters that don't really say anything sure. than there are dudes that are extra characters that don't say anything. So I just didn't know why the person who played Molly couldn't have been McGonagall or I was just thinking that. something like that. The person who played Lavender could have been McGonagall. It just feels like there were a enough women kind of just chilling on the side. Yeah. And of course, I don't know the inner workings of Starkid to know who was actually available. It's a main role. Maybe they were only giving the main roles to people who could prepare and also, so like, I'm not going to act like I know from experience, but my initial reaction was just like, oh man, you know? Yeah. And I think a lot of this is what they were reacting to at the time was who were the, the people that the like it was like fan service, like who the people the audience was most expecting to see in a big silly role. So Tyler oh, Brunsman, who played McGonagall, I think plays. I think he played Lucius. He plays Lucius. Yeah, he's Lucius. And so he was such a fan favorite for two that I think, rightly or wrongly, they were reacting to make our sort of like main stable of players put them in the main roles and then like not paying attention to gender. So okay. for better or worse, that's how it read. So McGonagall comes in and she immediately says that they've killed Professor Sprout. And of course, I was like, oh, great. Just kill another woman character. What are we doing? <laughs> but whatever. I kind of think it's funny to kill Professor Sprout. I don't know why it's funny. <laughs> it's a little funny to me. Because it's like, it's like it's Professor Sprout. Of course, she's always in her greenhouse. And if you, I don't know. There's some, there was something ineffable about that humorous note to me. So McGonagall states that she's the headmaster, which I think is fantastic. She then calls herself a reasonable, uptight bitch. And what I appreciate is that no one in the audience laughed. I was like, let's go, audience. Smart and proud of you. The, here's another question I had for you, because I have been politely reminded at LeakyCon that there are a lot of children in attendance, so I try to tailor my language accordingly <laughs> when I'm on stage. Star Kid is very known for some of their characters. Just the joke is that they curse a lot. So how was that approached in terms of Leaky Con? Did you have to put up the parental advisory stickers all over or what was up? So a couple, a couple of things. We did think about this. A couple of things went into just letting Star Kid kind of do their thing. This audience, there weren't a lot of kids. Okay. The 2012 
Harry Potter fan audience was almost all millennials. Yeah, I guess it makes sense because now you would have people like the ones that I'm going to. People are old enough to have kids that like Harry Potter now kind of thing. That's exactly what's happening. These people are coming back with their kids and it's wild. (laughs) And so that was like such the deep flush of the fandom days that we weren't very worried about very small children. There were some children, but it wasn't, you know. And then we just figured, well, Starkid, these are all people that know Starkid. Starkid has this reputation. They curse at their shows, and they've, they've cursed a little, you know, like, they, they, we sort of were just like, you just do you. You just do what comes naturally. And nobody, you know, we didn't get any, like, feedback about that, about being upset about language. Yeah, and I think that they don't use it as much as they did in some other shows, but there's still the occasional F-bomb. I think that they've reeled it in a bit to where it's actually funny and not the point where they're just cursing all over the place. I am not, I'm still not the most comfortable just using bitch as a synonym for woman. Right. And I understand some people are trying to reclaim the word and use it in different ways, but I think what, what rubs me the wrong way, and I'm not a woman, so I'm not acting like I can be in the place where I'm like, I'm offended on your behalf and you can't use this word Uh, just to me i feel uncomfortable when it's a sentence like this where it just says i'm an uptight bitch it's you could have just said i'm an uptight woman i like you didn't need to say it kind of thing it's also like written by two white men played by a white man like there's a lot of like there's a lot sis there's a lot of like stuff there you know so totally i'll say though that this audience so this is 2012 in 2013 at LeakyCon, the dj who we had hired for like We'd never met before we hired him for that day, and what he wasn't very good. He started playing blurred lines. Oh no! Okay, wait. What year is this? Twenty thirteen. What month was it? June. Blurred lines had expired by June. I know this because I went to New Orleans in, I think it was May of two thousand thirteen, and that was like the last month it was good, and I got to see live bands do it, which was cool. And then I remember during that listening to the lyrics more because I could understand them. And I was like, this song's not good. It's not good. And then by the end of the month, it was gone. So this DJ played it. Ooh. And the audience stopped dancing and started booing. Hell yeah, Leaky Con audience. And he stopped. He turned it off. And I, I wasn't in the I was like outside the room and somebody like came out and told me what happened. And I remember just like my heart just swallowing. I was like, yeah, Leaky Con. Thank you. Now, here's my question. When at LeakyCon dance parties, people play songs from musicals and I boo, why don't the song stop? Because <laughs> <laughs> because you're wrong. I know. I understand that I'm in the minority of person that does not want to hear songs from a musical at <laughs> LeakyCon dance party. I feel like I need a separate dance party of like, this is the music only dance party. <laughs> For Mike Schubert by himself. That's really funny. At LeakyCon, the Mountain Goats is a dance song. It's why, <laughs> yeah. I, it's such a strange little place we've created. It's so great. It's such a, a hodgepodge and mix, and that's just what happens when you open the playlist suggestions to everyone, and it's a beautiful mess. Absolutely. <laughs> I love beautiful messes. Bring them. That's what this show is. It's a beautiful mess. It's wonderful. So then enter Draco, finally. Anytime I'm watching these, I'm just waiting for Draco to come on because Lauren Lopez's Draco Malfoy is the best. So I'm glad that it wasn't long before Draco gets in the mix. I personally am a Lauren Lopez stan account. That's me. She just seems like a truly wonderful person. She is. I know nothing about her aside from the things I've seen on social media and everyone telling me I should get her on the show, but she's very busy. She seems great. Yeah, I've gotten to know her a bunch since then, just as like, you know, just as a human, just as a person. Mm-hmm. And um, she's just, I can't, I can't even, she's wonderful and kooky and as creative as you imagine and really caring and is fantastic. And one of these days we're going to get her and Tom Felton at one <gasps> like, It's going <gasps> to happen. I swear to you, it will happen. The one, like, it's like the only leaky con since I've known her that she hasn't been able to go to was the one he came to. <sighs> Oh, yeah, that'll be very fun. That'll be very much like when Andy Samberg as Nick Cage interviewed Nick Cage with Get in the Cage on SNL. It'll just be so perfect. If I could just pay you in advance to somehow moderate that live show. <laughs> That's really funny. I think I would just want to throw them, the two Honestly, of them on yeah, the Honestly, yeah, don't put anyone else on. And just like don't let water it, it down. happen. Just see what happens. She'll just start rolling around the round. Honestly? Yeah. I'm here for it. I'm here, to, I'm here for it. A dance lesson. It could be Lauren as Draco teaching Tom Felton as Draco how to dance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So Draco comes in, vouches for Harry's innocence, which surprises everyone, and then blames the situation on their bilingual friend Dora, which is a Dora the Explorer doll that he was bringing into the scene. And I love McGonagall's reaction immediately just goes, Miss Explorer! I love, right? And Tyler's ability in that moment. Miss Explorer! 
They are. Ugh, it's wonderful. But Draco then has to hand over Dora, but then before giving it over, voices Dora and then goes, Te amo tambien, lo siento, after Draco says, <laughs> I love you to Dora. <laughs> Uh, I don't even like the, their minds. Where does this even come from? And they never explain it. And I'm just very confused of, is Dora a person? Is Dora a doll? Is it both? Because Draco then says that Dora was cheating on them with Paddington Bear behind his back. So I just have no idea where it falls and they never answer it. And that's fine. Answer to all of that is yes. <laughs> So Draco then tries to offer their friendship to Harry, and Harry pushes Draco aside, says that he'll never be Draco's friend. Draco tries to get Harry to remember the good times they had together, mentions killing the last Horcrux, which I guess was just an unwritten thing, <laughs> and then saving Harry in a very Potter sequel. And then Draco alludes to, in their third year, everyone went to pig farts and, quote, we had so many clean jokes and good songs and nobody swore. And then Harry steps up and says, oh yeah, I remember that year. Fuck that year. And that is, <laughs> they did it. They made a good use of cursing. It wasn't just for throwaway. It was actually for effect. And I, you just love to see Starkid grow. You love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and the audience to the first F-bomb being dropped, quite loud, quite the response. Yeah. And that shows you, like, appropriately used, it has real humor and, and real power. And Darren really bites into it. It's really good. I, lo I love this whole Draco is trying to be his friend and Harry just keeps rebuffing it and just, you know, especially considering Chris Child. Yep. It's like if Draco never got the hint in Sorcerer's Stone when he's trying to be Harry's friend, just Lauren Lopez Draco just keeps on trying and never wants to give up. It's Lauren. What Lauren Lopez did was just look at Draco in, in the books and rip away <laughs> all consciousness and go right to the subconsciousness and then just push right all of that right up. And the then top. a dash of I'm <laughs> also know? a child. It was wonderful because Draco just needs some friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also feel bad for the Starkid inbox. I'm sure they get emails every single day asking them to write the story of that third year where they actually go to pig farts. Yeah, I'm sure they do. I'm sure that that is in high demand from Starkid fans. So a bunch of students then enter. Mostly it's all of the same that we've seen throughout the first two plays, but we have the addition of Colin Creevy. Colin is about to take a photo. Harry says, make sure you get my good side, and then starts to spin, which, ugh. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. The Darren spin. <laughs> Nobody spins like Darren. <laughs> Look it up. It's like a thing. Oh, it's a thing. Oh, it's a thing. He has spun in everything. In Harry Potter, in Glee, in Horror Story, he does this, like incredibly stylistic spin. It's great. There's like long gifts of this going on. Okay, I'll have to look into it. From what I noticed, he does the good job of turning his head and keeping solid eye contact. So like, even though your body moves, the head stays where it needs to be focused. It was impressive. Hey, it's Editing Mike here. Just wanted to stop in and apologize for past Mike's transgressions once again. There was an obvious joke that could have been made here and he failed to do so. I want to apologize for that. Because we were talking about Darren Chris's proficiency at spins and twirls, past Mike should have said Darren Chris, more like Darren Twist. Am I right? I'm very sorry that this joke wasn't made. I hope you can forgive past Mike. Anyway, back to the podcast. Really good dance move. Those Michigan teachers know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So then Harry says about Colin Creevy, quote, I can tell that kid has a long and a illustrious career ahead of him and the moan oh, and groan so of the audience is so satisfying just a collective oh. and it had been five years at that point too but we didn't we didn't care i've learned that with harry potter it is eternally too soon with everything and anything yes i love in this show how they lean into harry just being like a super dick because he is he's such a jerk he and they just are like let's just play in that space let's just show that Harry's not this nice dude. And it's it's kind of refreshing. And especially, again, in a 2020, 2020 lens, looking at Harry from outside our eyes. It's also just fun. I think it's very fun when he is being self-obsessed. The only times I don't really like it is when he's being rude to Hermione or Ginny or something like that. But when it's Harry being so self-concerned that he 
doesn't even notice that other people exist, I think it's at its best. Totally. And I think that they do a good job, at least in this first act, which I've seen so far. So McGonagall announces that Cho Chang is head girl and that the head boy who was supposed to be slated for this year was eaten by Fenrir Greyback. So they're going to have a head boy election. And of course, it's between Harry and Draco. After the first term. So they're just not going to have a head boy for half the year. I guess. But I mean, I'm not well versed in what a head boy actually does in Hogwarts or in real British schools, which I learned the hard way that head boys are a real British thing and not just a Hogwarts thing. But I don't know. What do they do? I, I, the, the only thing I could compare it to is a valedictorian where you just get the award at the end of the year. So I don't know. Not even, I don't even know if it's valedictorian. I think it's like um, school president. Oh, okay. Okay. I think that's closer to it. And I think you sort of help teachers and you are like a TA okay. almost. Or okay. I mean, I've also, attention, I think. class president, at least in my high school, didn't do anything. So it was just a popularity contest of no. someone yeah. that did it nothing i think the teachers like sort of give prefects and head ch- and head kids or whatever responsibilities to help and then that looks good on your resume or whatever okay yeah i mean i guess they do the line leadering stuff when you're a prefect so right yeah so the campaign manager for draco's campaign was going to be both crab and goyle but they say that crab died in fiend fire so of course the timelines are just it's everything else at this point basically so they have to replace crab with the trolley witch which is a very fun Do you know addition. who that is? Oh, no, I don't. That's Pat Brady. That's their manager. <gasps> oh, the famed Pat Brady. Yep. We've talked very positively of Pat Brady <laughs> on the podcast so far because I didn't know this, but Pat Brady is also Tessa and Anna Brisbane's agents, and they were the past two guests. So it's just a whole Pat Brady circle. She's great. Of all the agents that I've reached out to to try to get important people on Potterless, only one person has come through, and that's Pat Brady. So Pat it was a big Harry Potter convention attender before any of this. Oh. So she is like deep in the fandom, loves going to Harry Potter conventions, has been incredibly supportive in helping us arrange all everything that we've done with LeakyCon and Star Kid, um, and just fiercely, fiercely loves and protects those that group while also not being like gating about them, you know? That's amazing. She also just survived an insane car accident. Oh no. She had like dozens of surgeries. It's she's very public about it. She talks about it. Okay, cool. It is a miracle that she survived, and it's it's really remarkable. That reminds me of Jim Tavare, who was also a leaky con. He went through a really rough car accident. Yes, he did. Wow. Power to her. Pat Brady. Potterless has just become a Pat Brady Stan podcast at this point. Yep. Yep. So then Lockhart comes in, and I got to say that after he comes in, gives an introduction, his costume is flawless. Absolutely fantastic. But if uh, anyone wants to go and listen to a particular part, go to Act 1, Part 3 of A Very Potter Senior Year. Go to 8 minutes and 29 seconds, because there's a dude who must be sitting near a microphone just coughing up a lung. <laughs> and uh, it's just a great little moment of you just hear someone like... <laughs> you still don't hear the ping. You know? I, I guess they just couldn't edit around it. But there is some fun uh, throat noises going on at that part. Oh, that's another thing, is that we had people roaming the aisles looking for phones it's the only time one of the oh, very few to get times. people to not film stuff yes we were very and people were mostly very very good but we were very clear that if there was any filming you'd be kicked out of the convention without refund the end gone dang we were very serious about it so that's why i don't think you really see any videos where you can hear the being <laughs> because of that <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. So Gilderoy is saying that Harry Potter is old news and Harry is very upset at this notion. He tries to play Hermione can't draw on guitar and Gilderoy says anybody can play that. It takes a real man to tickle the ivories and he goes over to the piano and all the girls are immediately swooning and then he launches into a song which is truly fantastic. I love the Gilderoy Lockhart song. It might be my favorite. It's at least my favorite so far of a very Potter senior year. AJ Holmes, who plays Gilderoy, is an accomplished actor. He's like on several tours. I think he was on tour for Book of Mormon. He's he's doing really well out there in the theater world. And Good he is him. that great classic Broadway voice, you know? And this song, and especially Get In My Mouth, are just <laughs> the increased sophistication of the Starkid music is really apparent. And I think this 
Gilderoy song is is the one where it shows the most. It's really funny. The lyrics are very clever. There is one part, though, where he says that Harry is acting queer and then the whole audience laughs. And then I got disappointed in the audience, which are we we're just laughing at the word queer. What's the word that I'm looking for? I like um, butted against that, too. And I don't believe it was because of gay implications. No, I think it was just synonym for weird. And then the whole audience was like, ha, 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 ha. He said the word. There might have been something else going on on the stage. You know, that's true. There were a couple moments where people were laughing and I guess the camera that they used for the video just didn't pick it up. So perhaps something else happened. But yeah, it seemed like in the context of the song, he was just using synonym for weird that rhymed with the other line in the song. And then everyone was like, (laughs) yeah, but then the end of the song is my favorite because it's just him listing off his accomplishments and the accomplishments given are those of fictional heroes. So he talks about destroying the ring in Mordor and all of these other things that happen in popular fiction novels. And it just, it just is the perfect parody of a character, which you take this character who's already kind of ridiculous in the Harry Potter series and you just crank him up to 11 and you expand a bit beyond the Harry Potter universe. And just having him take credit for all these other things is so funny to me. It's perfect. And this was the time that Twilight was such a big deal. This was like Mm -hmm. the Twilight and like the kind of like YA boom that came after Harry Potter. You know? Yeah, that was the vibe that I got. Yeah. It's not that YA wasn't being written before, that YA wasn't like a thing. I mean, the classification of YA was new with Harry Potter. It's just that so many really big kind of blockbuster series came after Harry Potter between Twilight, Hunger Games, all all the ones that are being like talked about here. So it was it was really in the zeitgeist for them to attribute them all to Gilderoy. How brilliant. It's also perfect, and I assume this was intentional where talking about Harry Potter the character being an old hat was probably pretty relevant with people thinking that Harry Potter, the subject was old hat because 2012, like that's right in that in between Valley of now we look at it with the nostalgia and it's so old that we have appreciation for it, but also it was a couple years out. So I'm sure that making stuff around then, and you have a ton of experience with this for running LeakyCon at that time. I'm sure some people look down upon it as why do you still care about Harry Potter? They haven't made anything in four years, etc. Yeah, we get that a lot. I mean, I'm getting it a ton of it right now mm-hmm. with people who are, are, are nasty about Jake Rowling and, and nasty about us. Like there was a, New York Times article about all the Joe stuff and I explained in it that I, you know, was buying the series for my nephew and couldn't anymore and bought him Jer- Percy Jack and it said and said that I was like heartbroken about it and some guy like on Twitter just of course on Twitter went off like this 40-year-old woman is so upset blah blah, blah so heartbroken it's like what do you even screw you this meant this means things to people you know and this 2012 idea that maybe Harry is is done was something that we were being hit with a lot especially in 2011 when a lot of this was being written probably it was the end of the movies and so when the movies ended we got hit so hard with what are you gonna do harry potter's over we can do harry potter's over harry potter's over harry potter's over and it's, we we couldn't say enough harry potter's not over what do you harry potter's not over you know and uh yeah i appreciated them addressing that in this mm-hmm. i am legitimately very curious and worried about what's going to happen for, like, future Harry Potter adaptation stuff because of what J.K. Rowling is doing. Like, does this hurt the chances of making the HBO series where we actually get 10 episodes per book kind of thing? I'm very worried that we're not going to get any more future HP stuff. I'm a little worried about that. I think it's more going to affect Fantastic Beasts. Yeah, are are you going to make the third one? Because you've got the triple combo of Johnny Depp, Ezra Miller, and J.K. all in the same movie. That's... That's a big clusterfuck. Did you see that Ezra Miller video? What was that? That is terrifying. I don't know the context, but it looks very bad optic-wise. Now, I know Johnny Depp and his legal team have released evidence and information that shows that Amber Heard actually abused Johnny and there was some lying. That's all under court trial right now, so I'm not going to repeat the mistake I made in the past, which I've apologized for, which is just jumping the gun too quickly before talking about this situation. We don't know the full extent of everything here, but regardless of who is guilty, who is innocent, that still caused a lot of commotion. And then you have that coupled with a video of Ezra Miller choking a fan in the street. It's just not a good look. And then you have to factor in that the second movie sucked ass, so who cares about this franchise at all? I don't think they're making it to five. I think if they make the next one, it'll be a miracle. (sighs) Not a miracle. I think the next one's going to probably get made, but I think that'll probably be it. Yeah, do you think they're... I mean, I you have no way of knowing, but I wonder if they will rewrite it to turn it into a trilogy instead of a pen... 
pentology? What is a five? Is that what a five is? A, a pentology? Penta- Interesting. No, because that's the study of pentagrams. <laughs> it's pentology. Who knows? A pentagy. A, a, pe- a patent. A pe- whatever. A five something. A pentagogy. A pedagogy. <laughs> I wonder if if they'll just wrap it up. If they'll just tell the story they got to tell and just wrap it up. I wonder. I think they got to get through three because it's like waving into defeat. You know. I think they have to like get through three. Let it make money over time, but I I can't imagine they're going to make five of these. No way. And if I, I mean, there's no way you can make them without J.K.'s blessing. Like, you can't fire her, can you? <laughs> could Warner Brothers? Could they? I don't know what their contracts look like, but she's an executive producer as well. Yeah, I don't so, know. My guess is no. We'll see. So Stephen Clovis, I think, is like sort of doctoring. I don't know. We'll find out. But we'll uh, find out. I, I'm I'm not I I'm not waiting on bated breath. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no! I gotta find out what happens to that guy who writes a textbook. I, you know, seriously, I it, you tried, you know, <laughs> you tried. I just I wanted to love them a lot, and I tried hard for a long time, and then she started burning her legacy down by hating on vulnerable people. So I got nothing left. Woo! So Gilderoy finishes the song. Everyone except Ginny leaves. And then Harry starts to feel some sort of pain. And what he decides that it is, is because he is an old hat and he's too predictable and people don't like him. So in order to switch and spice things up, he decides that he has to break up with Ginny. (laughs) It starts off as just, it's just so uncomfortable to watch. You just feel so bad for Ginny, but he ends up with something really funny. He says, it's not that I don't like you. It's that other people don't like me. It's nothing personal. (laughs) I feel like they're actually, exercising a little bit of white fragility, not white fragility, but male fragility demons here, uh, that it sort of is satisfying to watch, you know? Yeah. And it's just the classic narcissistic thing of only really being concerned about optics and how people perceive you above all else, like not caring about anything else except for how it looks and how other people receive it. And this is not something that Harry actually is or does, but I I enjoy this version of Harry's like reflection on men (laughs) no offense no it's we are men are we're very bad as a whole we are so bad we're bad at so much treatment of women high on the list (laughs) treatment of women uh fashion uh (laughs) like turning everything into a boys club for no good reason oh everything is a boys club telling other people how they should feel and uh we're just Gosh, fedoras exist. We're so bad. We're so bad. (laughs) Jared Dudley exists. Oh, Jared Dudley. I could not. not, I couldn't. (laughs) Shout out to the horse listeners that are like, oh, damn. (laughs) (laughs) Come on. You know, you know, my duel with him will go on forever and I will take every opportunity. It's the most Philly thing about you, and I love it so much. Yeah. Hey, it's Editing Mike here. If you didn't understand that Jared Dudley joke, first off, it means you probably don't listen to Horse Witch. How dare you? But don't worry, I will explain this joke to you. Jared Dudley is someone that got into fights with some players on Melissa's favorite team in a playoff series. Not this season, not the season prior, but the season before that. So this is a three-year grudge that she's holding, and I really appreciate that about her. And it's a very Philadelphia-type thing to do, and her favorite team is the Philadelphia 76ers. So now that we understand all of this, while I've got you, let's do, you know, let's Let's just take a little bit of a break here for Wingardium at Ridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Sleep Cycle. Now, let's say hypothetically that you are Harry Potter and you can't get a good night's sleep because Voldemort is giving you awful nightmares and Dumbledore has you up till weird hours of the morning trying to find horcruxes. You want to try to get your sleep schedule back on track and make sure that you are getting restful and relaxing sleep. What are you going to do? You're going to use Sleep Cycle. Sleep Cycle is the app to help you improve your sleep. It tracks and analyzes your sleep, and it helps you wake up, and they have both a free version and a premium version. Using Sleep Cycle is super simple. All you have to do is plug in your phone while you sleep and put it on your nightstand, and it will analyze your sleep and provide you with insights when you wake up. You can see things like when you fell asleep and how soundly you slept while you were asleep and how many times you tossed and turned or got up in the middle of the night, etc. But if you want to take it to the next level and get some premium features, they have things like the wake-up window, which they can tell when you are in lighter sleep, and that's when they will wake you up during a set range that you give them so that when you wake up, you feel more refreshed and not a feeling like you're jet-lagged. They also have a sleep aid, so if you need 
need help trying to get to sleep right away, Sleep Cycle can help you do that as well. Kelly and I have been using Sleep Cycle and we love it so far. We have very different sleeping problems, mainly in that I don't sleep enough and Kelly doesn't sleep soundly enough through the night. So we're using it to achieve different goals, but we're both excited to continue using it. So if you want to start analyzing your sleep with Sleep Cycle and check out their insights and some of the premium features, as a Potterless listener, you are in luck. You can go to sleepcycle.com slash Potterless today to start improving your sleep for free. And if you do go to that website, sleepcycle.com slash Potterless, you will also get access to Sleep Cycle Premium for seven days absolutely free. So go to sleepcycle.com slash Potterless, download Sleep Cycle, check out those premium features, see if you want to extend it beyond the seven-day free trial, and start improving your sleep tonight today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Function of Beauty. Now, let's say hypothetically that you are a podcast host that takes care of their hair quite a bit, and you have very voluminous and some would say obnoxious hair, but you know, you try to make it look as good as you can because as a podcaster, you don't get seen in public that often, so when you are seen, you want to make sure that you look gorgeous and your hair is on point. How are you going to make sure your hair looks perfect? You're going to get shampoo and conditioner from Function of Beauty. Function of Beauty is hair care that is formulated specifically for you. No matter what your hair type, they have shampoos, conditioners, and treatments to fit your unique needs. Everybody's got different hair, so why should shampoo and conditioner be one size fits all? It doesn't make any sense. Here's how it all works. First, you take a quick but thorough quiz to let Function of Beauty know about what your hair is like and what improvements you would like to make to your hair. Then their team determines the right blend of ingredients and they bottle your custom formula made to order for you. Then they deliver your personalized formula directly to your door in a cute customized bottle with your name on it and everything. I really enjoyed the whole process. My shampoo and conditioner is in the mail right now. I'm very excited to get it soon, but it was nice to say like I have thick hair, but at the same time, I want my hair to be voluminous and these usually go against each other. Please help me, function of beauty. Also, you can really customize it. You can pick what scent it is, what color it is, so many different options. What's also great is their formulas are vegan and cruelty-free. They never use sulfates, parabens, or any other harmful ingredients. I don't know what a paraben is, but it doesn't sound good, and I don't want it in my hair. And Function of Beauty is not just the first ever customized hair brand. It is the internet's top-rated customized hair care brand. They have over 40,000 real five-star reviews and counting. So what are you waiting for? Go to functionofbeauty.com slash Potterless to take your four-part hair profile quiz and save 20% off your first order. That's functionofbeauty.com slash Potterless for 20% off and to let them know that you heard about it from us. That's functionofbeauty.com slash Potterless. Save 20% on your first order. Take the quiz, get some customized hair care for you and have hair that is as good as your favorite podcast hosts who's obsessed with their hair today. And finally, today's episode of Powerless is brought to you by Thrive Market. Let's say hypothetically that you are a podcaster that went to spend some time with your family in Texas, figured let's see some family while we're allowed to work from home and stuff. We don't get this opportunity a lot, and then we'll go back to New York later. Now, your parents really like to buy organic food because they're all into healthy eating and stuff, but you don't normally get organic foods. But now that you're going back to New York and you're not buying organic foods, you miss some of that organic stuff that your parents got and you want to get it for yourself. How are you going to get this stuff delivered to you? You're going to use Thrive Market. They deliver the highest quality quality, organic, and sustainable essentials from groceries to healthy snacks to meat and seafood to clean wines to non-toxic cleaning to bath and body stuff. They've got it all. They tailor to over 70 different diets and values, so if you're doing something like paleo or keto or plant-based, you can search specifically for those approved foods on Thrive Market. And it's more than just having these products. They also do good things for the world. For each paid membership that someone has, they give a free one to someone in need, like a low-income family or a teacher or a veteran or a first responder. But it'll help you too, because as a member, you can save 25 to 50% off traditional retail prices, and their carbon neutral shipping is free on orders over $49. So it's really a win-win in multiple directions here. You're getting savings on your favorite clean, organic products. You are helping communities in need. You are helping the environment. It's just a great overall service. And in addition to the member matching I already mentioned, Thrive Market has raised over $750,000 to date through their COVID-19 relief fund. So they're just a bunch of good eggs. And if you want to get good organic eggs, you can go to Thrive thrivemarket.com slash Potterless, and you can join today. You'll get a free gift of your choosing up to $22 in value. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash Potterless to start your risk-free membership and get a free gift today. So go to thrivemarket.com slash Potterless, sign up, get a free gift, get some groceries, help the world, and make sure that you are eating the food that your parents got for you before, and now you can order it yourself like a big boy today. So... Ginny runs away crying. Then Ron comes in. Harry tells Ron, and Ron seems upset at first, but he's so hyped. He is so overjoyed that 
Harry isn't dating Ginny anymore because he says that he hated having to pretend to like his girlfriend, which is funny just in that I've had to deal with that in my past in high school a lot. But it's, of course, especially funny because Ginny's his sister, but right. very relatable of a teenage boy to never tell your friend any problems about their girlfriend or boyfriend or significant other. And then, of course, once it's over, you have to be like, oh, yeah, I actually hated them. It's like, why didn't you tell me earlier, yeah. Jeremy? <laughs> Je oh, who's Jeremy? Oh, not a real person. It's always a fake name. I'm sure it was real. Now, I always go with like three syllables. I find three syllables to be really good for saying angrily. Uh, my go-to for guys is Jeremy. My go-to for girls is Rebecca. Saying Rebecca angrily is so satisfying. Just being like, I don't know, Rebecca. Oh. It's awesome. Oh, it's just so good. Listen to me, Rebecca. I like it. I like it. Yeah. It's just powerful. You hit the r, you got the b, and then the k at the end. Man, yeah. satisfying that consonants. K sound. K is comedy. Yeah. When you're looking for comedic words. That's why fuck is so fun. Mm, it's just satisfying. It's a good consonant. <laughs> so then Harry sets off with Ron to win the head boy election. And we cut to Ginny crying in the bathroom. And we get Moaning Myrtle. This was, I think, the only thing I wasn't really big on yeah, so agreed. far. The fact that it was just mean and the guy playing her is just so crude about it. And the costume is sloppily done with, like, whatever the tennis balls as boobs in the right. shirt and it felt like some of the other older jokes I wasn't as comfortable with. Thankfully, it's very quick, but I don't know. There was... Ugh. A lot of their their jokes and the way they sort of pick on characters is a change. Even if it's a little bit offensive, it's a little bit different. This is just more picking on Myrtle for what she's picked on in the books, which is for not being conventionally attractive and for well i guess that's it i guess that's what it is so they sort of like just amp that up and you know there's a lot of that elsewhere so this just doesn't feel like it adds anything yeah it just ramps her up and turns her to be a bit nastier and she's calling Ginny names like a whiny bitch and all this stuff and it just ugh, it just i i wasn't a fan and i was very thankful that myrtle's appearance did not last very long Ginny writes in the diary and is very upset at harry and ends her diary entry with i hate harry potter and then you hear in the distance the voice of joe walker going hey, tell me about it <laughs> and you just the collective reaction of the crowd realizing what is about to happen is just so satisfying because everyone slowly realizes, oh, that's the same guy who played Voldemort in the first one. Oh, he's going to be Tom Riddle. Oh, he's going to be like, it's just them all going like, oh, the murmurs slowly getting louder. Gosh, it's so satisfying. Yeah. I'm another stan for Joe. <laughs> is that how standing works? I don't know. I'm old, but yes, yes. No, I stan Joe Walker. He is, um, he's freaking hilarious. And just really goes for it and bites into it. And I thought he did, I don't know, like really great work. Is that like a weird thing to say in this show? Yeah, no, I think he's very solid and it's really good. And I feel bad because part of what I didn't like about a very Potter sequel was the Umbridge stuff, but I don't really want to hold that against Joe Walker. And I also don't want to hold it against Starkey because they've apologized for how that rendition was done and all of that and the depiction of umbridge so i i i'm glad that he's back in a role that is prominent but not cringing of the uncomfortable nature i didn't want that to make me sour on joe because as a person or at least from what i get from the performances he seems like a great guy yeah he is he's a really cool guy i think he's like married now possibly good for him we're engaged i don't know everybody's so old <laughs> <laughs> so then when Ginny hears this voice, she goes, diary? And the diary goes, I'm a journal. Diaries are for girls. <laughs> and the, the, the repetition, they go well past three into like seven repetitions of this joke. And it does, it lands. They all land. This one's really solid and it works because he keeps making the mistake. He says, but yes, Ginny, I'm a diary. Shit, journal. And he just can't get it straight to call himself a journal. This is one of the times where when Starkid drills something into the ground, it's funny every single time to me. Uh, and I think it worked well. Absolutely. So he then tells Ginny to read the name on the cover. She struggles to pronounce Marvolo properly. <laughs> and then just to get her to stop, he goes, Ugh, it's just a made up name for this letter rearranging <laughs> trick. Just get to the last name. And then she mispronounces Riddle too. <laughs> I, I'm not like, I don't love the Ginny is stupid bit, but I do love the name. It's just a stupid name. Just It's a name rearranging thing. Like it's just the way they let you have fun with the text. Is really appreciated. Yeah, because that was, I always thought the Marvolo thing was so ridiculous. I never thought that she had thought of it from the beginning. She'll never tell us the truth whether or not, but I feel like she personally 
made Lord Voldemort, and then when was writing book two, said, oh, I should give him this real name and stuff. Uh, I could make a name, but I'm gonna have to make his middle name Marvolo, so then it's, I am Lord Voldemort? It's just such a workaround. Uh, uh, yeah, there's like, a couple like, like, of, like, um, shoehorns in the series, and I think that's one of them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then we cut to the flashback at Wool Orphanage, and Mrs. Cole, I think, is a very funny, brief cameo role in here. She is so theatric and so over the top and just ridiculous. It comes in off the bat saying, we have seven breeds of orphan, and then gets into, like, stereotypical orphans, I guess, of very small and rosy cheeks, but then ends it with, and one telekinetic antichrist. I know, it's great. Such a great... I love it. I love it so much. I think that's Alona May who plays her. Um, she was a star kid that wasn't in the original A Very Potter musical, but she was in this little... Do you know about Sammy? There's a little... I don't know if it was called Sammy or just her character was Sammy, but there's a song, Sammy, that Harry from the first musical is based on. It's like this. It's the same song. They just changed the name to Harry and changed some of the words. But it's a song that Darren wrote for... Oh, Little White Lies. That's what it's called. It's a web series called Little White Lies... That Darren oh, and I yeah, think yeah, yeah, Brian. Yes, and Nick. yes, yes, yes. Julia talked yeah, about this. Yeah, she was Sammy. Okay, that's really cool. So Dumbledore then walks in with the purple suit and scarfy around his neck. He starts to talk to Tom Riddle, and Tom is very sad, and he says that he hates the fact that when he was born, his mother died immediately after. And I never really thought of putting it this way, but it is really rough to think and the way he phrases it is the first thing i ever did was kill my mother which is <laughs> incredibly dark and not a single way i've ever thought of someone passing away at childbirth but yikes it's very dark it's very Tyrion lannister but also like dumbledore's response is maybe my favorite thing in the whole show oh sometimes you accidentally kill your family you know who you accidentally killed a sister in a fight with his boyfriend this guy like it's just it's <laughs> in Incredible. I think that you're right. I think this might be a one-two punch of like their darkest joke and potentially their funniest joke back to back. Totally. Gosh. And rightfully so, the crowd loses their shit at this joke. It is so yeah. funny. High moment. I guess the other element of this of why the crowd reacted to it so positively is he says he was in a big fight with his boyfriend. Now, you would be more understanding of the timeline of fandom stuff. Sure. But was this at the point where I guess JK had revealed, of course not in the books, but oh yeah, right, Dumbledore was gay the whole time, I totally promise. <laughs> but was this at the point where people were speculating their relationship with Grindelwald and it wasn't established? Like, where did that all stand? From the second she said that, people had that that intonation. And okay. some people, to their credit, saw that before she said it. When did she say it? At uh, Carnegie, I was actually in the room, it was Carnegie Hall, 2007, um, she did a big question and answer session now that now that the books were out and she could. So she did like a little a little book tour and then it ended with um, a big thing at Carnegie Hall and she invited all the people from Leaky to it because Leaky had really, really done a lot of work hiding spoilers in the last days before the book came out. There were so many spoilers. I was on the phone with Scholastic three times a day sending them spoilers we had gotten in email so that they could tamp them down. And then we wouldn't put wow. them online. We were like, we were like aide to camp. We were like helping stop the spoiling of the books through like the tips that we were getting in because we were trying to help it. We had forum moderators who were willing themselves to get spoiled My gosh. so that they could take them off our forum. And Joe was very, very appreciative of all that work. And so invited the management of Leaky to the event. So um, we had like five of our people in and we went backstage and met her and it was a great moment. And I'll, you know, memories are memories and they can still be good when things are shit later. Um, so it is a really nice memory. And then we were sitting in the, the box seats for that when she announced that Dumbledore was gay. And if you think it was a roar when Darren Chris came out in the audience in this crowd, you can't even imagine what it was like when she said that in that room. Wow. 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 Yeah. Wow. I'm sure, of course, some old stuffy man with a mustache went in the back. I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Joe Walker is mostly off book throughout this whole scene, which I think is very impressive. And Tom Riddle is very happy. He apparently has the magical ability rather than talking to snakes or torturing children. His magical ability is that he can shoot sparkles out of his hand. I love it so much. Later he's going sparkles, sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Walker, man. 
I love it. Uh, Dumbledore then hypes up Hogwarts so much so where it seems like he's intentionally lying about it, going as far to say things that they don't have homework and all of this. And Tom is so happy about it. He's so excited to go to the school. Dumbledore says, you look as gay as the 4th of July. And then Tom says, I'm magic, I'm gay. And Dumbledore goes, me too. It's, it's Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> really playing into it. So Dumbledore then launches into a song, and it's pretty solid, and the message of the song is always dance, which, as someone that agrees with the notion of always dancing, I appreciate it, but it goes on and spreads out and takes many different forms of always dancing, which I think is very fun, because we get into the story progressing of the flashback. Tom gets sorted, and he meets Lucius, who also loves to dance, and the first thing Lucius says is, when I grow up, I want to be a rocket. It's beautiful. I think... I think he was in the Radio City Music Hall show. Wow. And I forget as what. And so I think that's where that joke came from. That's very funny. I mean, it makes sense because there's a friendly dance-off that happens between Tom and Lucius. And Lucius can actually tap dance, which was a big complaint of mine with the first one, is that Voldemort has this whole tap dancing song, but he can't actually tap dance. But Lucius is, clearly knows what he's yeah. doing. Yeah, absolutely. Also, um, in this scene, we meet Bellatrix played by Brittany Coleman. Yes. Brittany Coleman is an up-and-coming Broadway star. She was in the ensemble of Tootsie. Uh, she was an understudy for the main role in Tootsie. And I think we're just going to see more and more of her. It's another one to really watch. That that crew is just full of talent. Yeah, good for her. I know this because in the first episode about a very Potter musical, I said, I like everyone. I don't like the person who played Bellatrix. I didn't think she was very good. And then a bunch of people emailed me like, she's on Broadway now, dog. So <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Her voice is wild. I think that's the biggest thing is her voice is very good. My complaint with her was that she felt very theater kitty. And I sure. think that just rubs me the wrong way more than her not actually being talented but she sings in this one as nice bellatrix or at least in the beginning she's nice bellatrix very very talented singer i mean university of michigan theater program is full of them <laughs> this is where they all come from so yes there's the friendly dance off and joe walker puts in lots of effort i will say but i will uh, i will not say he's the best technical dancer but i i hold true to the belief that the only bad dancing is not dancing and he goes for it in this and it's very funny and then he busts out this move that everyone is at awe of and he shoots out sparkles and everything. It's absolutely great. But then I don't know if if there was something, it felt like in the editing at least, that they either cut out Joe's mic or they used like a different recording. I felt like by the end of the song, the recording was coming from a different source that didn't feel live. I don't know what was going on. Yeah, there. I would not be surprised if it was either like seriously cleaned or there was some minor judging, <laughs> minor ADR work on this. <laughs> So then Tom is back with Ginny. The flashback is over and he is dancing with her more of a partner couple dance and she slowly falls into a trance. And then we cut to Gilderoy having an autograph line. Hermione is in the back of the line. She eventually gets to the front and she sees through his pricing scheme of autographs and headshots and stuff. And this tips Gilderoy off. He says, oh, you must be Hermione Granger if you're so clever. And he knows about Hermione because Flitwick told him that she's an aspiring writer. Flitwick says that Hermione's translations of Beetle the Bard kept him on the edge of the seat. And he says that's saying something because if that small man were to fall from a chair, oh, he could die. I, I think I missed that in my rewatch completely. <laughs> of any of the jokes to make about Flitwick being small, I think that is the, the funniest and least harmful that I could think it's of. It's like true, right? He is a small, like I don't think he would argue that he is a, not very tall person. Right. You know, and yeah, he could fall. He could die. <laughs> I don't know that that's true. But yeah, it's not it's not the I don't I don't I don't know. Maybe I'm being offensive right now. I don't I don't know. I don't think so. And if anything, Gilderoy's a, a jerk. So uh, a lot of the times when I'm pointing out things in these episodes of like, oh man, this person says something and it's bad. It's like, well, yes, that character is a bad person. So they make it. I don't think that that's a way to write off every bad joke in this play, though. I don't think you can be like, oh, well, Ron and Harry are supposed to be jerks, so they can call people whatever they want. We're supposed to think they're bad. It's like, yeah, eh, eh. like you have to look at the root of why is this joke funny? And is the joke funny because you said something mean and offensive? Like, I think you have, you can't just write everything off as these characters are mean or these characters are supposed to be jerks. Therefore, 
anything they get is a pass. I don't think you can necessarily do that. But I completely agree. I, that could be a factor here with Gilderoy. So Hermione says, my true passion is fan fiction. And the roof of the building falls off <laughs> with how <laughs> loud I mean, the look at the crowd is. you're in. This is like, this is the fan. This is not only the fanfic writing, but travels to a convention in Chicago crowd. You know, uh, it's pretty great. I totally get it. And I wonder if... When writing it, they did this intentionally where they said, ah, if we're doing this at LeakyCon, people will love it if we mention fan fiction or if it was just the way in which they did the story. But it would be funny if it was an intentional like they're going to eat this up <laughs> kind of a move. I think it's all part all of a piece, you know, right? It, it, it's all part of it. So Hermione says that especially her passion is making fan fiction based on his work. So she hands him over this Hunger Games fanfic where basically it boils down to Gilderoy falling in love with a character that represents Hermione. He starts to read it and he seems to be put off by it like, ew, oh, but then turns around and says, this is absolutely depraved. I love it. It makes Fifty Shades of Grey look like a book for kids. <laughs> Again, I turn to your knowledge. Was Fifty Shades of Grey something that people liked or did people hate it? Because I know it was started from fan fiction about Twilight. So I don't know if people were like, yay, cool, someone in fan fiction made it or if people were very upset about it. Fifty Shades of Grey is very bad, but very loved. Because it's like the first like mainstream book to sort of like talk about BDSM and other kind of things. But it's also incredibly problematic. Their idea of consent and their idea of safe practices and their idea of all it is just, it is like the worst book to possibly go mainstream about these things. And so it's like of two minds. But no, Fifty Shades of Grey is, is both horrifically bad, but it was like passed between women of a certain age and a certain kind and as like a sort of like permissive text to talk about these things i guess that piqued interest i just i i ugh, the idea that people would ever use it as like a primer on like difficult consensual relationships or like complicated consensual relationships really worries me so there's my PSA for the day. Okay. And then like the Harry Potter, does Harry Potter people did at the time, did they not like Twilight? Oh, like the Harry Potter people hated Twilight, but like also loved Twilight. It's, you know, again, it's like very like hate love. You had like <laughs> the Harry Potter stands that were like, shut up. I like it. Leave me alone. And then the Harry Potter stands were like, this is absolute crap. And we're so mad that there's another big series that, you know, is as popular. It's giving Harry Potter a run for its money in the press, which it never was. Nothing is ever going to be Harry Potter, but you know, it was getting a lot of press. And so there was a like definite rubbing tension between Harry Potter stands. There's a school of thought that like Twilight is actually pretty feminist. Uh -huh. And that's a complicated thing that I, you should talk to Takia about it if you really want to get into it from, from mischief. Um, okay. I'm not saying this like, definitely what she believes i'm probably misconstruing her opinion a little bit but we've definitely had conversations about like there are elements of deep feminism and like next level feminism in twilight and i think it's sort of holding up as something that's interesting and problematic to study you know 50 shades of gray not so much oh, okay all right <laughs> I'll have to check it out. So Gilderoy says that he was looking for someone to write his autobi er, uh, biography <laughs> and guilts Hermione basically into writing stuff about Harry as writing samples. And this one struck a particular nerve with me just because it just feels like such the classic, like, this will be great exposure kind of thing, which yeah. I hate so, 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 so much. Yeah, same. And I'm sure that Starkid has felt the same complaints. So I, I bet that this was them kind of writing their demons into a villain in their story. So then we cut to Draco trying to figure out campaign slogans with Goyle and the Trolley Witch. And Goyle has a very well-drawn owl. Again, the art department of oh, this trilogy is fantastic. Nick Lang is an incredible artist. That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. So Draco at first says, it's great, but it has nothing to do with me. Maybe you could have the owl saying, vote for Draco. He's a hoot. <laughs> and uh, the audience thankfully loves the pun. But then Goyle just very seriously says, I don't think the owl would say that. <laughs> I love Jim as he was the one who was um, friends. And I'm blanking. His last name starts with a P. Um, and I always know it. And right now I can't, it won't come up, but, um, Hey, it's me editing Mike to save you from screaming at your speakers or your headphones or your car. The name that Melissa was trying to think of here was Jim Pavolo. Ha ha. Thank you. Google. I mean, my brain for knowing this right off the top of my head. Anyway, back to the podcast. Really nice guy. He is such a perfect foil 
as Goyle to <laughs> Draco. <laughs> He's so much taller than Lauren Lopez and the voice he does like yeah. this deep high, I'm Goyle and I talk like this voice the whole time. Oh, it's just the farthest apart possible you can get and to have them together in scenes is so funny. Yeah, he's and he's also a really, really nice guy. All of the Star Kids seem like genuinely nice people. I mean, I haven't met one that I didn't like. That Harry guy's fine. <laughs> he's fine. <laughs> so then we cut to Harry and Ron doing the same thing, trying to figure out slogans. Harry makes a, a Hermione dog joke, which this is the kind of stuff I didn't like, saying like, oh, maybe she's going to start dating Fluffy because she's a dog. Ron, thankfully, doesn't like this, so I, I guess this is a, a, a good sign of Ron not being okay with just dunking on Hermione. I, I am just, I just want the Hermione dunking to end because uh, I just like her as a character. And I always feel bad when they're, they're just so mean to her in these three plays. Also, how many times is she going to save their life before they stop insulting her? You know, you know, you know? Yeah. They got over it after it just took one book in the regular series. Right. So they should just stop it. So then the sign that they have prepared says Malfoy is a snobbish, racist, elitist brat. And then Harry goes, so the rules are you can only run positive campaigns, which is why no one will be expecting this. <laughs> which is so Harry, right? It's so Harry. And screw the rules. I'm going to do it my way and I never face consequences for it. Of course not. So Lavender then walks in. She has a Potter Stinks badge and this just says that's Harry off an edge. He is so upset that someone would say he stinks. He wants to know where Lavender got it. Yells at her so much that she runs away. He asks Ron if he stinks. Do I smell bad? He's just, oh, he cannot stand this. And then Draco comes in. He sees the sign and he goes, ah, that's great. That sums up my campaign perfectly. <laughs> yeah, Lauren Lopez stan account. It sums up, it, yeah, Lauren Lopez is, mm -hmm. she hasn't rolled yet. In this. No, I need some flopping. I still haven't seen a good amount yeah, of flopping. Yeah, there's no Draco flop. Not yet. I'm sure it's coming. It has to. It has to be. So then Harry says to Draco, get rid of the buttons, Malfoy, or I'll kick you off my street team. Then we'll see who checks your tumbler. And I've never felt older right? than not comprehending. I know what a street team is. I know what a tumbler is. I don't understand why Draco would be a part of Harry's street team. I would not understand how that relates to tumbler because of it. This was one of my first moments of like, oh no. But I, I, I think it's more of like in 2012, I wasn't using Tumblr. So I'm not 100% sure. But I'm pretty sure a street team is just when like you, you set out and you like do things like put stickers up and posters up on someone's behalf. Yes, you have a, a team of people who will do things to help you get the word out about yourself, I guess. But also like the flaw here is looking for the logic. The flaw, <laughs> the flaw is in the search for the logic. But that's what I do. <laughs> so Harry hears a voice in the distance. And gosh, I love jokes like this as well, where the snake, the basilisk, instead just goes, snake. <laughs> I'm a snake. Yeah. <laughs> it's so perfectly stupid. Oh, it's I love it. Dumb. And Harry cannot realize that he can hear it because he can knows. He, like, come on, Harry, wake up. It's a snake. It's a snake, Harry. <laughs> Get it together. Just so beautifully obvious. They hear a scream in the distance. They go to check it out. And it is Colin Creevy, plus the message written in blood, the air beware from Ginny. And she's there. Once Harry and everyone show up, Ginny runs away. And Draco reads the message. And then again, he goes, that's quite good. Now just add your next Mudbloods vote for Malfoy. <laughs> it's Great. Gosh, it's just fantastic. So then McGonagall comes in. She explains the whole chamber situation. Ron is worried, but Harry is actually excited because if he saves the school, he'll be a shoe in to win. But he kind of just wants Ron to handle it because he has a date with Cho Chang and then he skips off stage. And I think that is the perfect place to end this <laughs> second episode of covering a very Potter senior year first act. So we didn't really talk about it last time, but I guess of how do you feel about this play? Not necessarily as someone that put it on for leaky comp but just fan of Harry Potter content. How do you appreciate this first act? It was such a, f a blur <laughs> when I first watched it, the first time, like the first time, because of the weekend and everything it was. So I haven't really gone back and dug in in a long time. And I got to say, like, it kind of holds up. It's, it has its moments, and we've talked about those, but it's funny and sharp and silly and celebratory. Like, all these people flying all from all over the world to get together to celebrate this thing that they love, but also have a lot of 
fun with it. Starcade brought so much of that and we're so appreciative that they did. And I think they still do. And especially now in a time where we're trying to look at Harry Potter more critically and now we have to contend with all this stuff about Joe. I think it's even, I think it's allowed me a little bit of room to just like enjoy the ridiculousness of it. So yeah, I, I really, I really loved it. I'm going to go watch the second act now. Yeah, I'm very excited. I am excited to continue it. I know that I was warned by Tessa that it is very, very long. And at first I was worried about that, but I think I'm enjoying this one the most of all of them oh, awesome. purely just because of like the, the level of humor and the quality of humor and the types of jokes they're going for are ones that I like more. And there's less of those types of jokes going on. So if there was one to be incredibly long, I'm glad it's this one. And I'm so glad that we got to talk about behind the scenes stuff throughout these two episodes. This was very fun. Me too. I'll try and find you some photos so you can throw on Patreon or something for of, of the behind the scenes stuff. Oh, bonus <laughs> content. You love to see it. Uh, so if people want to find you doing stuff, podcast world and otherwise, where can they do so? Podcast world is Pottercast, World Nine and Three Quarters, and Extraneous, where I talk about his dark materials. I forgot about that one. I got to stop being on podcasts. Also, <laughs> all of our conventions, we have Broadway Con, we have Podcast Con coming next year, one hopes. Um, please, 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 please. Uh, yeah, that's going to be great. Leaky Con, all the, the cons, Mischief Management, and also the Leaky Cauldron, which is obviously still still going after all these years. Uh, that's awesome. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for joining listeners. Thanks for listening. And as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter on their slogans for when they're trying to win the election for head boy or head girl, <gasps> wizard on. Do they? Do <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. I had to do it. <laughs> no, you have I'm to. Gonna do it every time. There's no, mm. there's no getting away from it now. <laughs> Hey, are you all caught up on Potterless and you need something else to listen to? You should listen to my newest podcast, Meddling Adults. Barb and Joel, my parents were on episode nine, so I don't know why you haven't listened to it already. It is a game show for charity where I have two guests compete to try to solve mysteries from children's entertainment, such as Encyclopedia Brown or Scooby-Doo or Nancy Drew or Clue Jr. It's a fun time, it's silly, and we raise money for good causes along the way. I'm very biased, but I think you will love it. You can learn about it and listen to it at meddlingadults.com. Potterless was created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Klauser, Lopu, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Rose, Marie Dodge, Marie Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivdenera, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Nikita Power, Ali Madsen, Amelia Krauss, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Pulido, Orca Grower, Vivian, the Owl, Haley Hastings, Moser, Alex Consilver, John Kotker, Noel Basile, Liz Bigelow, Brandon Pickens, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer, Mark Lou, Frida, J. Svensson, Summer Rathel, Justin Montero, Jacob Parrish, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Addy, Nikki Harris, Kine, Amanda, Alfred, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Sarah Shetter, Morta Morrison, Eileen Gazesh, Keegan Curran, Mr. Folk, Maya, Floor Sake, Sirius Garage for Georgia Davis, Skyla Lily, Edel Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskovchova, Elizabeth Christofferson, Michael David Yordi, Kelly Otilio, Kerry Crumpler, Connie Binkowski, Jen Went, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Samantha Lentz, Aurora Fruhoff, Marco Cepeda, Courtney Marie Grieger, Ashen Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Fail on the Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, McKenna Tweedy, Heather Langeal, Brad Harding, Brianna Cusumano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Chrissy Tu, Jarls Fiven, Ashley Enstrom, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jen and Rose Dow, Callahan and Darius, Leah Reed, Melissa Robb, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Elizabeth Yu, Britt McLean, Becca Spry, Reese Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Lily's mom, T Run Money, Madison Kyle, Don't Call Me Ninfedora, GK Have It Your Way, Sabrina Balsaker, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farzan Jarabat, Melanie DeGrave, David Douglas, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Yimki, Bony Pony, Jacob Rossitano, Kelsey Gillespie, Taco Blowfish, Rike Mango Jensen, Taylor Payne, Rachel Mobbs, Megan Moon, Alicia Chapman, Riley Kittis, Colleen Waters, Laurel Happy, Ross Ann Batamana, Erica Butler, Miranda Hurley, Landon Schwausch, Kendra Hertz, Natanya Page, Yogan Chanley, Darcy Alexandra Harrison, Richard Johnson, Sandra Rose, Kremick Roberts, Andre Kaufman, K.A. Rob, Steve Trelore, Lior Nahum, Angela Hill, Julia Buzak, Demi Lynn, Kelsey Wellis, Michael Beck, Calista Delano, She Who Doesn't Have to Be Named, L. Kringle, Love Cash Longer, Jennifer Terzian, Crystal Pollard, Henrique Wolf, Jeremy Elmore, Delkis, Katrina Smith, Jerrica Law, Michelle Spurgeon, Casey Canales, Megan Stempin, Let's Hit a Thousand Patrons, Serenity, Alan Jax, G, Sophia Lyons, Sot, Matthew Babbitt, Dane Nemcher, Rochelle Unitmaz, Kirsty, Robin Garcia, Chick Parr, Mermaid and her Daddykins, Aaron Uggs, Not My Daughter, You Biatch, Ilaria Vicentin, Liam Simmons, Lori, Gregory Hughes, Christy Lee, Call Call Mother Feathers, Nina Jazalik, Ribbon Monstrosity, Brittany Harper, Matrix, it's definitely Ludo Bagman, Ashley Somers, Grant Sohn, your friendly neighborhood Ravenclaw, Gavin Miller, Steamed Nuggets, and Carrot High Potter. Web design by Kelly Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com for bonus content. You go to patreon.com slash potterless for merchandise like our new Can't I Potter mugs. You can go to potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. And if you want to tell someone about the show, whether you reach out directly, or you leave a rating and review online. Both of those help. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as I say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Wizard on!